Dear ladies and gentlemen who are joining us remotely, none of you have asked any questions about trade so far, but that's all right. We're going to start the discussion there, and then we'll bring in your conversation priorities. Um, and the same goes to you, expert panel. If you're not that interested in the trade issues, then we can move on to other areas too, because our speakers can deal with an awful lot of stuff. Hmm? But if you don't mind, we're going to start with this theme that Oscar laid before us, which is, is are we going to have unforeseen and negative consequences as a result of this huge amount of generous climate policy that we've seen announced recently? Or does it really not matter? Is it much more important that things are happening and things are moving, right? I had a discussion with Jay Edmonds last night, and he said, what does it matter if prices go up a bit and it's inflationary? Things are moving, right? So let's start there. Daria, you were the one who said that we need to watch out for the price effects. So, how do you, how, what's your response to Jay Edmonds? So we've seen these lots of very generous climate policy coming in. Surely that's the key thing. Yeah, I mean, so the, the policies are welcome, the subsidies are welcome because uh, um, we see that they are working and you know, companies are moving, but I think that it, 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 we need to keep also in mind the, the other effects. And so I wouldn't say that there is a trade-off. And so I think that part of what I try to do is to show really that these two things are not in contradiction, but actually are, are reinforcing one another. And I think the, the main problem right now is that there is a lot of skepticism in the multilateral trading system and what it can achieve. And partly it's for lack of knowledge about how these things work. And, and, and partly it's because uh, one stakeholder of which we cannot make the name has blocked the way it's working. And so I think that it's just that we need to add to those five objectives, this sixth objective, to keep wanting to do it alone. Uh, sorry, <laughs> to keep wanting to do it together. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Professor Rosendahl, you mentioned in your list of questions that we could ask you, risk of trade war. Do you think that measures like CBAM and the Zero Industrial Act, Net Zero Industrial Act, and Rare Good Materials Act, and Inflation Reduction Act, and all of them, that they are actually going to create, so add to the trade tensions we're already going through. Yeah, so when it comes to the CBAM, uh, there are several countries that have reacted quite negatively to this, both uh, China, Russia, and the US also, I think. Um, so but it's difficult to, to know how this will uh, turn out in the end. Uh, it's also a fear that this may uh, have an impact, a negative impact on the climate negotiations because after all this is a climate policy and uh, uh, it may make the negotiation a bit more difficult possibly. But uh, as I also mentioned, it may also lead other countries to start uh, using CO2 pricing more because if they implement CO2 prices in their own country... Say that again, it may encourage other countries to do what? to implement carbon prices. Okay. So for instance, uh, so China has already an emission trading system, but much lower prices of CO2. So whenever a company is importing or will import, uh, let's say steel or, or aluminium to EU, they have to pay this tariff. But if they are, have already paid for their emissions in their home country, they no longer have to pay this tariff. So that's sort of an incentive for other countries to also implement carbon prices so that their companies don't have to pay the tariff when, uh, when uh, selling to Europe. Yeah, so we have to say it hasn't yet been introduced yet. This is, no. this is something that's going to come in towards the end of 2023 and then phased in and taken more and more yes. products in the uh, course of the Starting gradually years. from 2026. Mm. Indeed. Um, so, Helga Holbener, you, you tantalizingly said that you thought the CBAM might be seen as being less than just. Elaborate. So, so I think a global carbon price would be great. You know, if, if it was allowed to come up with a utopian answer to how to deal with this, well, well I think I would, if I, if I was a politician, uh, I, I would have argued that everybody gets their own carbon budget. You know, everybody gets the, uh, the same and then they can trade around it. And I think you will eliminate almost all the sustainable development goals issues it, in one go. You get rid of poverty, you have perfect distribution. Uh, so why are we not doing it? Because it's, of course, politically completely impossible. 
Uh, and that's why you need to do something else instead. And I, I do hope that we'll then see that you get the local carbon tax. But imagine if that is India. That, that is very different. That means that uh, Indian people who will now have air conditioning, since you mentioned India, will do that. They, you know, the in, the, just the need for India for air conditioning until 2050 is the same as the entire energy need for Germany today, just that increase. Why should they pay so much more to have something that we have had for granted for so long? That's the injustice part of, of CBAM that I'm, I'm worried about. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, unfortunately, I can't say I have a much better solution for you that I think actually politically will work. Uh, so, so we need to try many vectors to, to deal with it. But I, I wish there's some distribution as well. So it's not the poor world. Yeah. And, and just one more note on that. We talked about, somebody mentioned on the LNG flow, right? So we talk about, yeah, now Europe is coping. Yeah, why is Europe coping? That's because Pakistan and Bangladesh can't afford buying LNG anymore. That's the reason why you had the chart on where, where this uh, uh, cargo suddenly go. No, yeah, that so is the also global injustices can be exacerbated by something like this, even though there might be opportunities here in, in Europe. Um, we're on the edge of no, Europe. We're kind of honorary no Europeans, right? Uh, as a Brit, I have to say I'm an honorary European too. So I have a question for you, which is actually exactly what's been put to you um, by one of our, our audience, uh, Emil Dimanchov, and that's for Marie. Has the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM, changed ThyssenKrupp's business outlook? I mean, is it a positive thing for you? No, it did not. Yeah. Um, I think um, CBAM could help. It's, I think it's a question of implementing CBAM, how, how they really do it, because you can't see in a, a product, in a steel product, if it's carbon Free or it's carbon free, it's not carbon free, it's steel. But um, if you had to use uh, a blast furnace for it or a direct reduction plant, so it's 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 a question of implementing. It's not so easy to to just say, okay, um, everything which is coming up and has a green dot on it, it's fine and it's green now. But how do you really follow up if it's a green product or not? Yeah, I yeah, it's definitely are, part. Of in your interest to be part of that process yes. of implementation, isn't yeah. it? Um, and Graham, can I ask you a more general question, really, which is, to what extent does Sumitomo in Europe think about all these, these, these incentives, basically, that are being put forward to European business, which are still um, nascent, we don't know the details, yeah. but that presumably will offer you opportunities to? I think that's exactly right, yeah. Because um, when, you, when you have a headquarters which is abroad, you're always competing for human resources and capital. Headquarters is going to say, where is that going to go in the world? And what we're doing from Europe, we say we're a European company, we want Europe to succeed. So what we're doing is, is showing how Europe is ahead and showing where this money is coming from and showing how the regulation is changing and saying, yes, Europe is really competitive for this, for this industry. So you know, please give us more money, more people to pursue projects in, in Europe. But so you mentioned offshore wind, four or five different projects. Yeah. What is Sumitobo Corporation doing in that field? It's just investing with partners in offshore wind projects um, just around the UK, Belgium, Germany. And it's just one of those areas, as I said, with the scenario planning, you look at energy, energy generation from 2030 to 2050, and we just need offshore wind. It's one of those sort of ideas that you, you just have to invest in if you are serious about providing energy. Um, but also the point about the just transition, if I may mention that, about CBAM and some of the problems. And um, when I ask in our company about what's happening with CBAM in J Japan, um, I think they're going to introduce one in 2026. I heard there's a small scheme in Tokyo, but of course the important thing, well, what will be the carbon price? Um, you know, and how that's going to be arranged internationally? It's a political question, but yes, it's going to impact on companies, um, these decisions that they make about investment, about where to concentrate, and, and it will be important. Um, and, and this just transition as well. I, I went to COP26 in Glasgow. This was just when I was thinking about this. And I just was surprised. I went to the um, seminar about coal and the way that coal is ingrained. The vested interest in Southeast Asia and places like India, where it's an important employer, it, it supports the transportation industry. You know, how are we going to how are we going to sort these things out for CBAM, for just transition, for all of these issues? It's, it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, but yes, I'm optimistic about what business can do, because governments often seem quite constrained. 
But to answer your question, yes, it's very encouraging what Europe are doing uh, as a leader, and we can appeal to that when we have headquarters in other parts of the world. Whatever the consequences might be elsewhere. Yeah. Let's have some questions from our expert panel. Um, where should we start? Why not Madlena? Yes, my question goes to Maria, and I refer to two things. One is a course I'm teaching at my home university, Economics of Technical, Technical Change, where we also look at major companies and their long-term history and how they adapted over time. The second reference is to this morning uh, Handelsblatt news, where I learned that ThyssenKrupp owners are currently dis uh, discussing whether they want to sell the steel business entirely, that's one extreme position, or whether to keep only the steel business. That's mm -hmm. the other position that was communicated. So I was a bit puzzled and think about adding ThyssenKrupp to the list of companies that we look into by lecture. That's a very Maria. cool question. So, Maria, what's your... What's going on? What are you allowed to <laughs> share with us? <laughs> Thank you for this question. <laughs> I read the article yesterday evening already. Um, I cannot comment, of course, about the press article um, uh, right now. Um, but that uh, ThyssenKrupp um, uh, is a big company with different... Um, different companies in it, yeah, from Nucera electrolyzers to steel business um, is very, um, uh, really good known here. And how to proceed in the future, we don't know. Steel is a very volatile market. We need a lot of capex now, as I described before. Um, we, will, we will need eight to maybe 10 billion uh, euros in the next 15, 20 years to really decarbonize our production. And of course, for a, for a company um, with different shareholders, there are different views uh, on that, how to do it, and if you should invest it in Germany, and so on and so on. I think there are a lot of questions, but it's not yet decided where the journey is going, as far as I know. More pointed, if I may add. Yeah. Did ThyssenKrupp lose the competence, sorry, in the zero carbon steel making business, is the blast furnace not good enough anymore no. where the core competence of yeah. ThyssenKrupp was? Four weeks ago, I listened to, the, to a talk by an Austrian expert on steel making in Austria, a yeah. very famous country, small, but very good in steel making, yeah. and they believe they can survive the changes towards zero carbon steel making using their established know-how. So we are, um, we are not experts in only using a blast furnace, we are experts in making steel. That's a lot more than just doing the upstream first step of reducing iron ore. And of course, reducing iron ore in a blast furnace is a bit different than doing it in a direct reduction plant. But in the end, we are one of the best experts as a firm for um, producing steel. And of course, we will survive this. It's, it's now a question um, in which way and in which journey we will do it. But in the end, we have to replace our blast furnace. This is for sure. There will be no blast furnace in 2045 at latest um, in, in, in Duisburg. And so we have to do this transition which journey we really go and where to do it and so on. I think there are some strategic decisions. It's also dependent on regulatory uh, questions and so on. But in the end, ThyssenKrupp will produce premium steel, but without any car, uh, CO2 emissions. Yeah, without being loyal to one technology or another. Thank you, Reinhard. Um, who would, who would uh, Xi Yang. Well, thank you for taking that question. I have a quick question on the, uh, your comments on the US IRA on global trading, especially for European uh, countries. Uh, as we know, the IRA really changed the game, and it will bring the uh, US industry to be uh, very cost effective, uh, like to bring the hydrogen to reduce 50% uh, in the coming 10 years. Well, uh, Andrew also mentioned it in the last session, Norway may benefit 
to scale up its uh, cheap electrolyzer and its globe trading. But at the same time, it will be challenges to the other European countries. A lot of criticizes on this franchising. So I'm very curious about your comments and it's possible as um, responses from the Norway side and from the European side. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Helga Haugener, do you want to give us a, your thoughts on how the whole, the, 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 the trading system is evolving as the uh, climate action and climate policies are yeah. evolving? No, so it, it was very interesting when the IRA ca came out because in one way Europe has been saying why aren't the US doing anything about this and uh, there was a lot of complaining and then suddenly the US does something in the big bang and then the complaining is we're not going to be able to compete against that. You know? so, so in that case it was a bit of a strange dynamic I think. Uh, you know, it's very significant what they introduced. Uh, it changes uh, the break-evens of producing blue hydrogen, for example, in, in the U.S. or blue ammonia uh, massively in the U.S. And yes, that should all else equal give some advantages for U.S. industries uh, working close to that. And then. The trouble with this, of course, the more protectionist this is seen, and the more protectionist, of course, it is in reality, the more there will be a tit-for-tat type of response. So if then Europe will respond in a similar way, then something that actually was a good thing, you know, the IRA was there to really encourage significant amount of uh, low-carbon investments. That's a good thing. And then if that ends up with just tit-for-tat and a big trade war and then every supply chain for itself, uh, it's going to be extremely hard. Uh, some of you might notice on the slide uh, uh, I showed just for Europe, this 100-year supply chain. Uh, it would take 100 years with current supply chain to, to, to replace the, uh, just the power part. That's just the power part of the business. So to deal with the challenge, we need global cooperation. Uh, I think what the US did on the IRA was actually a step in the right direction in terms of intent. And then I just hope it doesn't end up as an escalating trade war and protectionism because then we all lose. And Daria, would you like to add your thoughts? Yeah, actually, um, I uh, so and also taking up something that Maria said before about uh, how Thyssen Group being a global company works, and this is that. Uh, so in all this discussion, sometimes we give for granted that if we put enough money in it, uh, we will we will achieve the intended objective. But what I think we know from companies is that there are deep capabilities that are needed in these frontier industries. And these deep capabilities are very difficult to move around the world. And so this global cooperation is also needed to succeed because we are not going to be able to move expertise, capital quickly enough. And so we need to let the companies be able to mix and match if we need to do this transition rapidly. Thanks, Daria. Um, I'm going to bring in another question, if you don't mind. Um, Frank O'Sullivan. Um, perhaps a follow-up to this. So I, I think this dynamic between the IRA passage and uh, CBAM and so on is going to be a very interesting experiment. I'm going to, for the panel's benefit, just throw out a contention. I'd like your reactions. And that contention is that the US wins in terms of the cost effectiveness of its ability to deliver, let's say, low carbon electrons first, mm -hmm. and also low carbon molecules secondly. CBAN just provides what is not existing today, which is an offtake market for a lot of these projects. So you see in the US today a lot of announcements, very large blue and green ammonia projects, for example, no real place to put that green or blue ammonia yet. CBAM provides exactly that opportunity. And I, I see this on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, um, that the, the objective now is to build it in the States to move that product to Europe. I'm curious, you know, from a European perspective, that is ultimately, I mean, I think that's like at the, the macro level, social welfare benefits are probably positive, but I think it's actually a threat to European industrial policy, certainly around green molecules. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there just to okay. see the reaction. Let's get a response from Professor Rosendahl first and then Helge Hogan. Um, yeah, so I think um, 
So I, I think I agree with you that this IRA is, uh, is mostly a good thing when it comes to reducing emissions. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, also unfortunate, both the protectionist mm. thing, but also the fact that the US is only going on the subsidies and not on the, on the, the pricing, of that I, pricing of CO2 that I was focusing on, because I think it's very difficult to, to reduce emissions uh, in a large scale only using subsidies. Uh, you need a combination of, of putting a price on your emissions, but also uh, giving subsidies to, uh, uh, to especially development of these new technologies and, and adoption of these new technologies. So I think that's uh, one important difference uh, between the US uh, uh, and Europe. Helga Hagene. You're going to need so much low carbon energy in, in the future. So, so yes, I do think in, in the short term time frame there could be something about sort of outcompeting in, in the markets. But if, if you look at the need uh, to be able to, to really transition, we basically need all we can get. Uh, so, so at least on the green side, I'm not worried about that at all. You know, the more the better, the more renewables the better. When you have enough, you can start making green out of it. Uh, on blue, it perhaps a bit more this competition part. And, and of course, the US has a good starting point uh, as well. They have a lot of gas resources. They're relatively cheap. Uh, it's usually clo uh, closer to, to your storage facilities. So they will get an energy advantage over Europe, the, the, the way I see it. But that will probably happen regardless. But now, through the IRA, they're at least being serious about taking down the carbon as well. They already had the energy advantage. Quick question that's come in from our audience, and it's actually an amalgamation of many around this theme. And it's for Daria. Uh, is degrowth implemented in World Bank models? Is degrowth, de using less, shrinking? More generally, what role does energy use reduction play? and how should it be regulated? So it's a tricky one for you. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the first part I got it, the second, sorry, the just simplify it because I'm, I'm So firstly, uh, is, sure is degrowth yeah. part of your, your models yeah. and energy use reduction? That's something that any of you can, can really, we haven't discussed it yet, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the role of sh sh shrinking consumption in terms of okay. meeting our transition targets. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, degrowth, I mean, so one thing is we need to really separate developing countries from developed countries. So, of course, you cannot have degrowth when um, a famous Swedish economist was saying, when uh, you are denying the washing machine <laughs> to all those people. So we need to give them the washing machines and many other more basic, we need to give them toilets, we give, uh, need to give them uh, medicine, we need to give them affordable housing, and, and those are not negotiable, need, uh, negotiable needs, right? Uh, so I think we do a clear distinction between uh, these situations. That said, I think that there is also a lot of possibility for doing things differently, and so what we are really trying to do at the World Bank is to understand really what the growth path of these countries should be, to reach minimum levels of dignity and human living uh, with minimizing uh, the emissions. Professor Rosendahl. Yeah, I just want to follow up on this uh, energy reduction that you asked about. Um, so I think that's uh, a very important issue and you showed also the, the challenges of building up all the new renewables. So we need to use uh, energy efficiently uh, and producing energy is, uh, is costly and we need to take that into account and as consumers and as companies we need to pay the cost of energy. So not only the, sort of the, the cost that you pay but also the, the environmental and the cost in, uh, in yeah, destroying uh, dif different na natural uh, habitats etc. So this needs to be taken into account. This has been a very important issue lately of course with the energy crisis but go, at least when we look forward we need to sort of get used to paying what it costs for energy. Yeah, and that's something that some regions are much more sensitive about than others. Cost equals taxes, right? Um, let's have a question. Christian Bauer. Yeah, many thanks for taking the question. Uh, why we are discussing as having a nice event on the Titanic? This is my question. We are on the Titanic. We're done discussing the problem as it is. We got yesterday the synthesis report from the IPCC. 
And if we take the 1.5 degree target at an 83% probability to reach the target plus uncertainties, then we have used our budget in this year. But we are talking on 2050. We are 30 years too late. And the consequences due to losing ice masses and a lot of other issues, cities like Oslo are physically lost as we talk here. It just take the one or the other decade longer, but it will happen. So why we're discussing as there would be not a real crisis which is at massive risk of our civilization. So why not massively accelerating the transition? Why not having more tough targets? We can have targets that are more tighter than 1.5. We can have lower targets. And there are, there are such studies. We can be negative uh, on a negative CO2 emission level in Europe by 2040. And it would not cost the fortune, much less than the energy crisis of the last year, much less. So why we are just talking to have everything that late? So my concrete question would be, what, what are in your institutions the concrete measures to have the job done by 2040, by 2035, which still means we will be 15 years too late? And are there any such concrete measures? Um, so, uh, Maria. Christian, first of all, thank you very much. I think it's, a, it's, a very, uh, it's a, the right comment to, to all of it. Um, in the end, what, really, what we did, we did a final um, final investment decision of more than 2 billion uh, euros without knowing in this point of time, we didn't know what is green hydrogen, one of our most important inputs. We don't know what green electricity is defined. We have no definition for green steel and so on and so on. There are so many open questions in our business case, but we still did the um, investment decision. And I think this is quite a bold move for a uh, for a company which, of course, in the end have to earn money, of course, yeah? So I think we, we already did some very courage uh, uh, moves, but in the end, you're totally right, we have to accelerate. And I think one important thing for that is to be pragmatic. To be pragmatic on the, on the um, political side, um, on, the, um, on the industrial side, and also for society. It's in, in Germany, it's a big question of not in my backyard, permitting and so on and so on. I the think, world over. <laughs> yeah, and I know there are, but, but in, in all, all this field from industry, political, society and so on, we have to decide what we like to achieve and then be pragmatic and go there. Graham Holman. Well, how do you address this question? Yeah, no, thank you. That was, I would agree with that. And thank you for the question. You're exactly right. I think from a, company's, a, a private company's perspective, or even a listed company's perspective, the one question is how quickly do the shareholders want to move? You know, businesses can, as we have done, you know, not making a decision on profit means that this will have impacts, which means that you have to answer to your shareholders. If the shareholders agree, they understand about this energy transition, they understand that you're throwing away some of the business that you could carry on with profitably. If they understand that, then I think businesses can move much quicker. So it's a whole society approach, I, I do think. Thank Daria, you. Daria, you're nodding. Yeah, no, uh, certainly. Uh, so the, the World Bank is through um, in the middle of a revolution and more will happen if the new president that has been nominated will be confirmed. And he's precisely coming with the mandate of seeing how um, an organization that has country programs, so we give money to countries to do more infrastructural things, can deliver on this public goods. And so there is a lot that is happening. Uh, but I agree, it's the shareholders. In our case, the shareholders are telling us you need to deliver on this public good that is climate change. And so we are uh, working on doing that. Professor Rizendal. So in my view, I think it's, uh, it's most important that the policymakers uh, put up policies so that it becomes more profitable for the companies to invest in, uh, in the green transition. But then there are some challenges. So one is uh, that, uh, that, as I pointed to, Europe is in front, uh, at least compared to, so even though we are not doing enough in Europe, we are at least uh, far uh, above most of the other part of the world, and that's sort of one challenge. Another is that you need to get the, the voters behind you somehow. So you need to find the right balance. So as an economist, I often favor putting a price on CO2 emissions, but you also need some other policies to make it more acceptable, and also to drive the green transition through, uh, through good subsidies to developing new technologies. So Helga, 
you are last, because there are many questions around this that have come in through our audience. So to put a, add a little bit more twist to Christian's point about why don't you do more faster, mm. there's one here from Jonathan Frommer who says, Equinor wants to have 50% of its investments in renewables by 2030. Why don't you just invest 100% in renewables immediately? And that's not all, my dear Helga. We've also got making it just, a word you use several times, would mean fossil fuel companies take responsibility for their scope three emissions too. How are you planning to do that? Yeah, so trying to answer all those four questions, then I won't go. I, I think you need to separate what companies can do a little bit and what governments can do, if I just start with that. Uh, I, I think as companies, and what we're trying to do now is to do things at scale, you know, because I, I agree with the situation that you described. So, okay, what are we then doing about it? Uh, we just announced a big collaboration with RWE uh, where we try to do something at significant scale, you know, where it's both backing up the renewables with something flexible, that would be flexible generation, and then having a plan for making that flexible generation uh, carbon free. And we can do that already by 2030. And we can do it at scale. These things can be scaled much, much more. If you take the uh, entire Dogger Bank, which uh, Again, another project we're doing, which is a massive project. It's a $10 billion type of project, biggest offshore wind farm in the world. If I convert all of that to hydrogen, it's the same as two wells of Gina Krog field, which we shut down now to provide some more uh, gas to uh, Europe. It was an injection wells. That's the size of magnitude we're talking about. So what we need to offer is to come up with something that has scale. Uh, we have collaboration with RWE in Germany. We have with SSE. Uh, We'll hopefully do much more with you going forward uh, as well. Uh, and, and I think companies are actually trying to do that. Then it, brings, then it comes to the policymakers. What can they, they then do to make sure this happens at, at the scale? First, it's an acknowledging missing money. The reason why I made the Chile comment that you all heard renewables isn't because of Chile specifically. It's because the notion that renewables is now cheaper than everything else is actually hurting the build out for renewables. So if you're really pro-renewables, don't say that, because that means that politicians will lean back and not do anything with the missing money. And when the missing money isn't done something with, then it doesn't happen. So that's the missing money. The second part the policymakers need to do is pragmatism. If you say, as EU, that you, only, you want as much hydrogen as possible, but 50% has to be green. But we don't have any renewables, hardly. If you took all the renewables in the world today, from solar and onshore wind, all of it, that would just cover 50% of the existing hydrogen need. It's nothing. So this pragmatism, we need to see from policymakers to be able to do things at scale. But I agree with the situation. I'm not sure if you're entirely happy with that answer, Christian, but you can continue the conversation over lunch because we've come to that delightful point in our conference where we're going to take a one-hour break. Please join me in saying a big thank you to yes. our panelists, Maria Yaroni, Graham Holman, um, Daria Taglioni, Professor Rosenthal, and Helga Haugener. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit more about your lunch options. Uh, friends and colleagues, there are two lounges where lunch is being served on the second and the third floors, and there you'll see spread out before you a number of small dishes. So please enjoy, catch up with your emails, and see you at 1.15 prompt. Until then. <laughs>